So, hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris Saunders. Um, I'm communications assistant at the Mary S. B. Sager Library. Um, I also work as a freelance writer in my spare time and I volunteer at the uh, Somerset Historical Center in the Genealogy Library, which is where I first came across this story. Um, you don't often think about local history having anything that's really going to surprise you, but uh, being at the Historical Center kind of uh, disabused me of that idea. About two and a half years ago, I was there. It was a typical day for me. I was working at the library, and a lady came in to the library saying she wanted to do research, and she had heard about uh, a slave that had run away during the 1830s through Somerset. And my first thought was, well, that's kind of interesting, but I doubt we're gonna have anything, because we know, we've heard a lot of stories about the Underground Railroad in this area, but they're kind of like folklore, family stories, not stuff that's easy to verify. It turns out this lady, her name was uh, Jane Williamson, and she was the director of the Ropeby, Vermont uh, Underground Railroad Museum. And she had in her possession a copy of a letter from an abolitionist from Ropeby named Oliver Johnson that he had written to a local abolitionist here in Jenner Township named William Griffith. And Mr. Griffith had been trusted with the care of an escaped slave from Maryland named Simon. And she had the letter, she knew the location of the house, and we'll see a picture of it later. And that was kind of like an aha moment for me. We finally have hard evidence of these stories. And so for the next couple of months, I dug into this further, and I found that there are a lot of stories out there from this area. I first put them together into an article for the Laurel Messenger, the Historical Center's uh, periodical, and I've tried to expand on that a little for our presentation today. And hopefully you'll learn a little bit of something both about the Underground Railroad and about our local history here. Now, the Underground Railroad, we're gonna spend some time on uh, general background information because of, although it's not exactly obscure, the Underground Railroad is subject of, to a lot of misconceptions and mythology. Um, this is a map I found online. Uh, it gets reproduced in a lot of textbooks, magazines, and things like that, and it shows, as it admits at the bottom, generalized routes of slaves escaping freedom. And you can see that the red arrows on this map tend to focus on major cities. And what do you know, the ones in Pennsylvania go all the way over to Philadelphia, which kind of leaves our area out of the picture. Um, and as we'll show, this is even this is kind of misleading because not only is it generalized, um, the Underground Railroad is not really, shouldn't be thought of as like a cohesive network. There was not like an Underground Railroad incorporated operating out of Boston or New York that was running everything. These were a lot of local networks of abolitionists and freedmen and women um, who would help slaves that came to their area, assist them with shelter, food, transportation to another area. Outside of big cities, where there were more organized efforts, uh, in New York and Philadelphia, there were what were called vigilance committees that did operate to, you know, at an organizational level. It was mostly local people who were opposed to slavery, or a lot of them were ex-slaves themselves, and we'll talk, meet some of them later in the presentation. Um, the Underground Railroad, of course, was not a railroad. I feel compelled to say that because <laughs> that seems to come up a lot um, in media and other things. Um, since it was not a centralized network, obviously there was not a path that you would, specific path that you would follow. Um, more substantially, uh, the Underground Railroad had kind of, has kind of an issue with the way the history was recorded over time. Um, there was a lot of work started being done in the years after the Civil War uh, most of the research, and I'll admit that I relied on a lot of it, was from an Ohio historian named Wilbur Siebert. And Mr. Siebert spent about 50 years from the 1890s to the 1940s doing as much firsthand research on the railroad as he could. He interviewed survivors, he um, got oral histories of people both who were conductors and who were escaped slaves. He looked through contemporary periodicals like newspapers, magazines, etc. And he put together a pretty formidable archive of things. He published a few books. And that, for a long time, was sort of the uh, basis for our knowledge of the Underground Railroad. 
There are two principal shortcomings, though, to Seaver. One, he was talking to people decades after the fact, sometimes 50 years or more, and you know people like to embellish stories or outright make them up. And especially after the Civil War and after slavery was over, a lot of people decided that, hey, I want to make myself look like a hero. And oh yeah, I helped this person, so I must have been part of the Underground Railroad. Now Siebert, to be fair, did try to weed out the ones that he found not credible or that he couldn't back up at all. But a person has to be kind of careful in what you take away from original source documents. The other problem with Siebert's story or research is that he focused mostly on white conductors. Um, and let's be fair, there were a lot of white people, white abolitionists who helped the Underground Railroad particularly in a lot of church communities. Uh, Quakers and Mennonites were overwhelmingly opposed to slavery and they tended to make up the backbone of the Underground Railroad. A lot of Presbyterian, Baptist, most of the major denominations were involved, at least on individual levels. But this narrative, not to say that it's inaccurate that there weren't a lot of white abolitionists helping out, there weren't a lot of interviews with actual slaves, with free blacks who helped with the railroad, and so the historiography that resulted from Siebert's research was kind of skewed in one way. And only in recent decades has there been sort of a tilt in the other direction. Um, I found a couple stories of black conductors in our area, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, along with the white ones who have uh, been better recorded over the years. And I think one thing that I do want to kind of stress during this presentation is this was an interracial effort. Um, this wasn't something you could say blacks were not passive uh, in, in, the slave, uh, in slavery. They didn't work sitting around their plantations waiting for the Union Army to come break them out. But at the same time, without underemphasizing that aspect, we also do need to look at the number of white people in the North at great risk to themselves who assisted in the railroad. And I hope that's uh, the takeaway we're gonna have from this uh, more nuanced understanding of the railroad. Now some general figures about the slave, slavery in the United States. Slavery was introduced to what's now the United States actually earlier than the date you've probably heard. In the 1580s, uh, the Spanish attempted to settle the eastern seaboard, mostly along what's now South Carolina, and among the original settlers were a number of slaves. The colony failed in large part because the slaves uh, had overthrew the attempt to set up the colony, and the colony died out. Um, it was introduced to Jamestown, Virginia in 1619, and pretty soon it was established throughout uh, all of the 13 colonies. Now certainly by the Civil War, as you can see, there were 3,953,760 slaves recorded in the 1860 census, which was the year before the Civil War. This was a total population of about 33 million Americans in both North and South. And most of these slaves were congregated in the Deep South in states like South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, where massive plantation and chattel slavery was the norm. In some states, uh, South Carolina, for instance, there were more slaves than there were whites in, before the Civil War. Um, and this is part of why it became such a pressing issue. Um, now, the figure of the number of freedmen that lived in the United States at the time is a little more indistinct. Um, I've seen estimates of anywhere from 400 to 500,000 in 1860. The census records that I was able to find weren't particularly precise. Now, the vast majority of freed blacks, as you might expect, lived in the north. Uh, there were small communities of freed blacks in southern cities like Richmond and New Orleans and Charleston, um, and a lot of them were involved in the railroad and related activities, but they were definitely in the minority. Um, now, how many slaves escaped from the Underground Railroad? The generally accepted estimate is 30 to 40,000. Um, that figure is kind of I would say it obscures more than it helps in a lot of ways. It does not account for the number of slaves who tried to escape and failed, um, which uh, for obvious reasons were never counted. 
It doesn't account for slaves who took alternate routes to freedom. Um, there have been historians in the past 20 years or so who found that there were at least a comparable number in the Deep South who went to Mexico because Mexico outlawed slavery in the 1820s. Um, and so we kind of have this indistinct number, but even if we accept this at face value, that is a small percentage of slaves. Most slaves did not escape or could not escape from slavery. Um, and I think another thing to, to emphasize here is that most of the slaves who did successfully escape, escaped from the upper south. St states like Maryland, Tennessee, Virginia, Kentucky that were bordering free states. If you were a slave living in Alabama, Mississippi, one of the really deep south states, unless you happen to live near a port city, your odds of escaping were close to zero. So part of the reason why there were so few successful escapes is just practically it wasn't, it, they weren't able to do so. And you have to consider also the obstacles that were put in their path. This was a quote I found in a really good book by Leon Litwock called uh, been in the storm so long, which is about the transition from slavery to freedom. Um, only a small percentage of slaves shows flight suggests the kind of obstacles that they faced. And what kind of obstacles did we have in mind? Well, besides the obvious ones of distance, terrain, rivers, things that you would have to surmount regardless, you had slave patrols, many of which were organized at the state level in the South to capture runaway slaves. Slave owners would often put out bounties on runaway slaves and hire bounty hunters to track slaves and they would even pursue them into the northern states. There was a recent book called The Kidnapping Club, I'm blanking on the author's name, which talked about an organization in New York City uh, that was made up of uh, pro-southern businessmen and corrupt police in the New York police force who got together and kidnapped blacks who lived in New York City and sent them south into slavery. And if that weren't bad enough, they didn't really care if they were run away slaves or not. So a lot of freedmen ended up getting kidnapped and sent south. Uh, there was a movie a few years ago called 12 Years a Slave about uh, Solomon Northup. He was a victim of the uh, kidnapping club. We don't know exact numbers, but it looks like several hundred people unfortunately had the same experience. And so beginning to a slave or to a free state was not necessarily being home free due to the Fugitive Slave Acts and related uh, legislation, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute here. And the mindset Harriet Tubman uh, articulated in her autobiography about slavery, I'd reason this out in my mind. There were one or two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would not have the other. For no man should take me alive. I should fight for my liberty as long as my strength lasted, and when the time came for me to go, the Lord would let them take me. And of course, she was very heavily involved in the Underground Railroad. She was a spy for the Union Army during the Civil War. So she lived the words that she preached. And another case, and this was also recorded in Litlock's book, um, this slave's name we don't know, but I thought it was a very revealing to some of the attitudes um, that people had then and a few people still have now about the institution of slavery. A Northern reporter interviewed a recently freed slave during Reconstruction right after the Civil War. And he had heard from this uh, slave's master's other slaves that he was a kind master who treated his slaves well and there was no reason for them to have run away. And the reporter put this question to this slave and asked, well, wasn't your master kind? Why, are you, why did you hate him so much? And the slave's comments response to this was, what do you mean kind? You know, he was my master. You know, he broke up my family. He sold my children and my wife into slavery. I've got pork and corn and food and shelter from this man. He did not whip me, he treated me well, but where is my wife and where are my children? I can get the pork and corn for myself, but where's my family? I can't get them back. And that's the mindset that a lot of slaves had not only ones like Tubman who were well known, uh, family separations were considered one of, if not the most traumatic parts of slavery. A master would often sell different members of a family to different owners, sometimes all the way across the country. And that's what this uh, gentleman is speaking to. It was unfortunately a fairly common practice. 
And one other thing we'll touch upon here as well are the limitations that the federal government placed on the rights of slaves, both people actually in slavery and runaway slaves. Now, the slavery is only mentioned twice in the Constitution. Once is the three-fifth compromise, which most of us are taught about in school, that southern states would count slaves as three-fifths of a person um, for purposes of census and the Electoral College. Um, the other one is the Fugitive Slave Clause, Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, which basically states, and I do not have the verbatim words in front of me, I'm afraid, that slaves are recognized as property, if a slave runs away from a slave state to a free state, they have to be returned to bondage. The owner's property rights supersede any other considerations. And this part of the Constitution was codified in the Fugitive Slave Act, which was passed in 1793. And much later, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which was a lot more restrictive. Um, and over time, slavery is just a recurring theme of American history before the Civil War. Every few years, slavery would kind of flare up as a major divisive issue, and then politicians would find a way, a compromise or a way to sort of paper over it, and then it would become increasingly urgent, and the compromises would become increasingly flimsy and eventually boiled over into the Civil War. Um, in the 1830s, I think, Certainly not the first confrontation over slavery, but the years in the 1830s were kind of when a lot of this stuff came to a head. You had the slave revolt of Nat Turner in Virginia. You had uh, the efforts by the Postal Service to outlaw abolitionist mail being sent from northern states to southern states um, on the grounds that if it were able to be freely circulated, it would incite further slave revolts. You had the gag rule in Congress, where Congress resolved that they would not discuss any petitions relating to slavery on the floor of Congress. This was agreed to in 1835 and remained in effect for seven years. Uh, Prig versus Pennsylvania, we'll talk about that, uh, generally considered one of, if not the worst decisions of the Supreme Court. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the Pennsylvania uh, part of the presentation. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which we mentioned in passing, was part of one of these compromises, the Compromise of 1850. Due to the Mexican War, there was a lot of dispute over whether the territory annexed from Mexico would become slave and free. Congress hammered out what was called the Compromise of 1850. And the northern free states got the promise that states like California would be allowed to enter the Union as free states. But the major concession to the South was a much harsher Fugitive Slave Act. Eric Foner, the Civil War historian, says that this was the greatest expansion of the federal government's rights to influence the day-to-day -day lives of American people before the Civil War, and probably one of the greatest instances ever. Because not, under this Fugitive Slave Act, not only was a slave not allowed to become free once they reached the North, the northern states were required to return them to the south, and local authorities or even local civilians could be arrested if they would not assist in the capture of runaway slaves. And this was, I think, one of the major causes of the Civil War because there was a huge and immediate backlash to this in the north, even in states that, where slavery wasn't really a lie, you know, considered too pressing an issue. And a lot of states, particularly in New England, immediately passed state-level laws trying to void the Fugitive Slave Act. In fact, if you look at the secession documents for a lot of the southern states that joined form the Confederacy, they specifically complain about these laws that the northern states had passed as violating the spirit of the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, and of course, there's Dred Scott versus Sanford, another contender for the worst Supreme Court decision ever when a freed slave uh, was taken to a, not a freed slave, I'm sorry, a slave was taken to a free territory he tried to sue his owner for freedom on the grounds that he was in a free state. The Supreme Court ruled he did not have the right to sue his owner. It didn't matter where he was, he was his owner's property. So you can see while there were incremental steps made to curb the spread and the influence of slavery, like the slave trade was outlawed in 1807, for instance, and there were a number of similar incremental laws 
it was occurring in tandem with this attempt to sort of make slavery a more, a stronger, more durable institution. Let's see where we are. And so the recourses that we have for, that slaves had, they had, runaway slaves had two recourses, which one of which, of course, is escape. This is a, an amusing story that I found in uh, one of the books I read about a guy named Henry Box Brown. He was a slave who lived in Richmond, Virginia. And in 1849, he and some of his abolitionist friends got an interesting idea of how he could escape slavery. He had himself sealed in a box and mailed to an abolitionist society in Philadelphia. Now, according to the version of the story I read, the abolitionists in Philadelphia had no idea that he was coming. <laughs> so they get this box that shows up at their headquarters one day and they open it up and there's this man just pops out. <laughs> now, the unfortunate thing, although it was fortunate for uh, Mr. Brown, this case got a lot of attention. Um, and it was all over the newspapers just because of how innovative it was. But unfortunately, it also meant that a lot of other slaves tried the same thing, and unfortunately, postmasters in the South knew that if there's a heavy package going to the North, well, you, know, you never know if this might happen again. Uh, another story I'll mention in passing um, involves the other uh, recourse that escaped slaves have, which is armed resistance. This did not happen all that often, again, just due to opportunity. And the illustration here is probably the most famous instance of this, the Christiana riot or the Christiana resistance as it's sometimes called. This occurred in Christiana outside Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There was an escaped slave named William Parker who had been freed by Quakers in the area. He opened a farmhouse on his property outside the town of Christiana where there was a large free black population. A number of slaves escaped from a slave owner named Edward Gorsuch in Maryland. And Gorsuch arrived in, Mar in uh, Lancaster County with a large posse consisting of himself, his son, um, a U.S. Marshal, several constables from Philadelphia, and supposedly a few freelance slave catchers. They were able to track them down to Parker's home. Parker had fortified his house and had about a half dozen men they exchanged crosswords, including Parker taunting Gorsuch with biblical verses. Um, gunfire broke out. The posse fell back and were preparing to, seize, to lay siege to Parker's cabin when a local Quaker alerted the free people in town, the free black people, of what was happening. And 30 to 40 uh, black farmers showed up with farming implements, mostly including corn knives. They attacked Gorsuch and his posse. They killed Gorsuch. They wounded, seriously wounded and captured his son and the U.S. Marshal and the Philadelphia constables ran away. And this was a huge incident at the time. It occurred right around the time the Fugitive Slave Act was passed into law. Millard Fillmore, who was the president at the time, decided to indict Parker and his associates for treason. Um, on the grounds that they had fired on a U.S. Marshal. And 44 people, I think it was, were indicted for treason, which makes it the largest treason indictment in the United States. Unfortunately for the federal government, all the freed blacks um, who were involved in this were helped north and escaped to Canada. And we know Frederick Douglass, for instance, was friends with Parker, and he was involved in large part in these men going north. So the U.S. Marshals descend on Christiana, they arrest two white Quakers um, for murder and treason. They are defended in court by none other than Thaddeus Stevens, the famous abolitionist congressman, and they are acquitted after about 15 minutes of deliberation. Um, now again, this is an extremely dramatic example because most slaves, runaway slaves or people in bondage did not have the opportunity for this kind of organized resistance. Um, but there were a lot of individual incidents of resistance, and one from our area, which I'll share with you. We unfortunately don't know the name of the slave, which, like we said earlier, that's kind of a recurring theme in a lot of the research. Uh, but the Liberator, the abolitionist newspaper, in 1838, 
reported that an escaped slave, again from Maryland, uh, arrived in Somerset with a $150 bounty on his head. A gentleman named Holland from Ohio, who was a professional slave catcher, showed up in town and captured this gentleman. Um, he cornered this, the slave outside a bar and was making to arrest him when the slave produced a knife and stabbed Holland in the heart. And a number of local Somerset residents um, took the slave, spirited him out of town, and he was up to Johnstown before the sheriff could organize a posse to catch him. So that kind of individual resistance is a lot more common than a, you know, a full-scale shootout or other forms of resistance, but it did occur. And now we get to the Pennsylvania part of the presentation here. Now, Pennsylvania, like all states at the time of independence, had slavery. Slavery was not just Southern. Um, Pennsylvania had about 3,700 slaves recorded on the first census taken post-independence in 1790. Now, I will emphasize that Northern slavery generally wasn't as large or as widespread or as integral to the state economies as it was in the South. Aside from New York, where there were large plantations, the kind of wholesale chattel slavery that you saw in the Carolinas or Alabama, Mississippi was not known in the North. It was mostly wealthy people who had house slaves, slaves who assisted with their businesses, things like that. But nonetheless, they were property. Um, and Pennsylvania was actually the first Northern state to abolish slavery. During the Revolutionary War, a gentleman named Roger Bryant, who was a judge in the Pennsylvania court, worked with the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, which was again made up mostly of Quakers because they were the principal abolitionists at this point in time, uh, convinced the state legislature to pass the act for the gradual abolition of slavery in 1780, while the Revolutionary War was still going on. But I would stress as we do here with the bullet points, this was not immediate emancipation. None of the northern states immediately emancipated their slaves. Um, I think the one that did was Vermont, which A, it wasn't one of the original 13 colonies. B, they had a grand total of 11 slaves. So it wasn't a great hardship. And from the story I heard, it was a businessman who lived in Burlington. When they outlawed slavery, he just took his slaves across the border to New York. So it wasn't a great hardship for the state to outlaw slavery. Now in Pennsylvania's case, the provisions of the law were all slaves born into slavery after the law was passed in 1780 would be freed at age 28. So this means that the earliest any slave was actually freed by this law would have been 1808. And slaves who were in bondage were not freed by their owners Owners were required under the provision of law to register their slaves with the state. They could be forfeited of their property, but that was about the only recourse slaves would have. Um, there was no provision for fugitive slaves in this law, so it adhered to the Constitution and the 1793 Act. Now, in 1826, there was an attempt by the state legislature to pass a law in Pennsylvania to protect fugitive slaves from being sent back south. And this law was on the books for about 16 years until Prig versus Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court case we alluded to earlier. There was a, an escaped slave from, where else, Maryland, who escaped into Pennsylvania. A slave catcher went into Pennsylvania to arrest them. Pennsylvania authorities arrested the slave catcher. A series of lawsuits and legal challenges made their way up the courts and the Supreme Court ruled Pennsylvania's law was unconstitutional and they had to send the slave back to its own. Um, so even though there was organized efforts in Pennsylvania to obviate the fugitive slave laws that were in place, uh, the federal government did not look kindly on that. Um, and so we know that as late as 1840, there were still slaves recorded in the Pennsylvania census rolls. And there is anecdotal evidence, although it's harder to verify that as late as the 1850s, so just a few years before the Civil War, there were still a few individual slaves in different parts of the state. So unfortunately, although Pennsylvania was one of the first states to abolish slavery, it took a while to actually affect it. Now our area was overwhelmingly, we shouldn't say abolitionist, 
which implies that they demanded an immediate end to slavery, but there was a general anti-slavery sense. Most people in, Pen in Somerset County were Whigs or later Republicans after the Whig Party ceased to exist, so they were at least opposed to slavery for economic reasons, if not necessarily moral ones. And you can see this by how our area was sort of a hub for Underground Railroad activity. Now, this is from a book called Underground Railroad in Pennsylvania, which is one of the books we have on the table over there uh, by a historian named William Slatawa. Uh, he details two routes on the Underground Railroad that pass through our general area. Uh, the first one is the Uniontown, Indiana route, where slaves escaping from either Cumberland, Maryland, or Morgantown, it would have been Virginia then, not yet West Virginia, went to the north to Uniontown, Greensburg, Indiana, and then points further north, usually to New York or Canada. The one that more directly concerns Somerset is the Bedford-Clearfield route, which most of the cases we're gonna talk about today um, involve. Again, Cumberland was the main point of access since it's just over the state line. They would go in Bedford and they would either go north to Clearfield, go west through Somerset, and then, or end up, and end up eventually in Johnstown, which was a major action, uh, center for abolitionist activity. And there was a historian um, who estimates that there is, were at least 500 slaves who escaped through the Somerset or the Bedford Clearfield route, and a lot of them went directly through Somerset. And we're going to discuss uh, for the last part of our presentation some specific cases. Some of these are more detailed than others because of the uh, records not necessarily being as detailed in some cases as others, but we'll go into them as much as we can. Now the first case is the gentleman we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, Simon. We do not know his last name. A lot of slaves really did not have last names, at least until they became free. Um, we know he was born around 1810 in Maryland. He escaped in 1837. He was helped over the border by some friends, and he was kept in the home of William Griffith, who was a farmer who lived out in uh, near Jenner Crossroads. This is a lithograph of his house um, around 1876. I believe this is from the Walker survey map and this is the house as it appears today. Um, it's a private property, but the house is still standing, and Mark Ware at the Historical Center, while I was putting the article together, talked to the owner, a past owner of the house, and he confirmed that there were hideaways in the uh, basement. And they didn't know what it was for because they'd never heard this underground, you know, this story about Simon, but it seems obvious to me, putting two and two together, that that's what those areas were for. So we know from, mostly from the letter from Oliver Johnson, um, from Ropeby, that Griffith allowed Simon to stay at his property for several months. He stayed in his basement, was given food and shelter, and he was allowed to work on the farm as a teamster with pack animals for pay. Um, Simon, we don't know a lot of actual hard information about him. He was apparently very talkative, and he liked to expound upon what he wanted to do after he escaped. He had friends and family in Canada already, but he preferred to remain in the United States if he could go somewhere safe. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened to Simon ultimately. He escaped to Philadelphia where he was helped by the black abolitionist there, William Still. He eventually made his way to Vermont where he met Oliver Johnson at Ropeby, and after that, the trail goes cold. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened to Simon after that. And Mr. Griffith was one of many uh, white abolitionists in the area. Some of their stories, like I said earlier, were only recorded years after the fact, so we have to be careful about accepting them as gospel truth. But I will touch, a, touch on quick here a couple of cases that are pretty well attested. Uh, there was a gentleman named William Poots, who was a, po a prominent lawyer and state legislator who was known to be involved in smuggling slaves out of Somerset to Johnstown. And again, Johnstown was the biggest hub in this area for freed slaves. Uh, we know a gentleman named William Possifwaite, who was a priest. I believe he was a Methodist, but anyway, he was, a, <laughs> he was a priest. And we know that he would take slaves that were brought to him out to a hiding place in Clearfield County. There was a cave um, 
where he would keep them for months, give them food and shelter, and do his best to protect them from any slave catchers. And there's this gentleman, William Willie, who is probably the most well-documented of them all. He turns up in Swatala's book, he turns up in Wilbur Siebert's book, and a number of other his, uh, underground railroad historians have found information about him before. He lived in Summerfield, which if you don't know, that was a town right by the Yakagani, which was flooded many years ago and is now almost entirely underwater. Um, he worked there as a shoemaker, a doctor, a nurse. Um, he owned a store in town, and he was very opposed to slavery. Um, one of the writer, the researchers who talks about him makes a point that he was both a Democrat and bitterly opposed to slavery, since that was unusual in those days. Um, he was recorded as say, saving, and it says untold number, which unfortunately is the way a lot of these accounts go. Um, along, they were safe along the roadways that we showed earlier, the National Road, which I believe is Route 40. Um, and he would travel on foot with slaves that were brought across the state line and personally escort them to a hiding place. Now he had a barn that was not on his home property, but he owned it outside of, outside of Summerfield and he would keep them there, provide them food and shelter. Um, some of them stayed for weeks or months. Based on the a testimony, it sounds like he helped several dozen people, but we don't know an exact number. Uh, Mr. Willie remained in Somerset through the Civil War. He enlisted in the Union Army despite being too old to serve and was made a nurse. And he died in the late 1860s. And he never talked about what he did with the Underground Railroad until his children related to the Somerset Standard newspaper many years later. And the next case is the Smith family. Now we were talking earlier about black conductors on the railroad. This is one of the more interesting ones. Uh, that I found. There was a family, they went by Smiths, which was assumed by historians to be an alias, of escaped slaves who owned a farm in Shade Township right outside what's now Karenbrook. And we know from first-hand accounts that they operated a farm and it sounds like a, an inn or a way station for travelers through the region. And during the 1850s and right before the Civil War, there are a lot of first-hand accounts of slaves going to their property, being given food, shelter, and again, paid jobs. There is a testimony in particular from a white laborer who was friends with the Smiths named A.M. Potts. And he recounted for Wilbur Siebert um, how he would work with these escaped slaves. He noted that they were very timid. They would not talk to him or any other white person because they were afraid they would be slave catchers but that, again, dozens of people probably passed through the Smith's property. Um, it was assumed that the slaves were, ex, or the Smiths were ex-slaves. We don't know 100% sure, but just based on the fact that there's so little information about them before they suddenly turn up on a census, um, that seems like a logical conclusion. Unfortunately, like Simon, after the Civil War, they disappeared. They moved out of the area. I've spent a decent part of the last two years trying to figure out where they went or what happened to them, and I have yet to have any luck. Maybe someday I or another researcher will figure that out. But uh, it was interesting to find that story because it was kind of an entry point into discovering that in Shade Township in particular, there were a large number of black, free black, or mixed race, what were called then mulatto people, who were recorded on census rolls in the 1840s and 1850s. Pretty decent population of free blacks in that area. And it doesn't seem like most of them stayed here beyond the Civil War. Uh, for whatever reason, they may have found better homes or jobs elsewhere. Um, and the last case, and this is the one that is easiest to document, um, for the simple fact that these gentlemen wrote a memoir, James Williams. Um, he was, again, from Maryland. We know he was from the town of Elkton, Maryland. He belonged to a master who was reportedly very harsh, whipped his slaves frequently. His mother and his brother had already escaped individually. And at age 13 in 1838, James um, was whipped by his master for an infraction that he wasn't informed about. It appears to have been just an arbitrary act of violence. 
Um, and after he recovered, James stole his master's horse and set out for Pennsylvania. And he arrived in Lancaster first because that was a major, considered known to be a major hub for the railroad. And he asked after his mother. And his mother said, or the person in Lancaster told him, well, your mother is living in Somerset with a free black man named William Jordan. Um, and he traveled to the west, the western part of the state. Um, it looks like they lived in Somerset, but they also owned property in Shea Township. Um, they were recorded in the 1850 census rolls as having a farm out there. But according to William's account, they were actually lived or at least had a business in the town of Somerset itself. Um, so Williams turns up, and then you can take this as it will if you want to consider it embellished, you know, use your judgment. He turns up at his mother's house in the dead of night, and she opens the door and has no idea who he is because she hasn't seen him since he was a little kid. So she starts peppering James with all these questions. What is my name? What is your brother's name who escaped? What was the name of your master? Where are you from? And James can't get his mother to accept that it's him. And fortunately for James, a friend of the family who had also escaped and joined up with his mother and with William Jordan enters the room and recognizes James with one look and he said, she says, my God, Abby, do you not recognize your own child? <laughs> and Abby just completely flips out, who's the mother. And she's like, well, what on earth are you doing here? And he gives the, the very quotable line, I paid my master leg bail for security. <laughs> so James initially planned to stay with his mother and his stepfather. But unfortunately, he found out from his stepfather that slave catchers had arrived in Somerset and were putting wanted posters of him up all over town. So he decided it probably wouldn't be a smart idea. So he went back to the eastern part of the state for a few years. He lived with a white abolitionist in Lancaster. And then when he was 16, he moved back to Somerset, where he operated for a number of years as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And he or one of the people he worked with would travel in a covered wagon over the border to Maryland. They would meet slaves in Clearing, um, or outside Cumberland, take them in the wagon, hide them in the wagon under provisions as they would go to the store, drive them either east to Lancaster or north to Johnstown, depending on where they wanted to go. And we know he did this for at least two or three years. It might have been longer. Um, Mr. Williams had quite the adventuresome life, and this is only a part of it. Um, at some point, he ended up in Philadelphia, and he was working with William Still, who was the famous black abolitionist who organized the railroad's activities in Philadelphia. During the uh, Lombard Street riot, which was a race riot in Philadelphia in 1842, he was shot in the leg with a shotgun and put out of commission as a conductor for a number of years. Um, he went to New York, apparently on either, it's unclear if it was on business or if it was a vacation. Um, he got into trouble at a bar over a gambling debt, got into a fight with the bar owner and fled south to Philadelphia before he could get arrested. Then he arrives in Philadelphia and discovers that the slave catchers are still looking for him and they found out where he was. And this would have been like 1848, 1849, so 10 years after he escaped. And his friends in Philadelphia arranged for him to travel to California, which is undergoing the gold rush. And so he books passengers on a ship and moves to San Francisco. He works as a miner for a number of years. He works for one of the mining companies. He never strikes it rich, unfortunately for him. Uh, but he does make enough money that he opens a business in San Francisco. He first had a restaurant that went bankrupt. Then he opened a dry goods store. Then, if you believe his story, he went to Mexico on a business trip. He was seduced by a Mexican lady who stole all of his money and thrown in prison um, until, and he stayed there for couple of months until his friends from San Francisco found out where he was and went south and got him north. Uh, when he gets back to San Francisco, he finds that somebody has bought out his business. So he moves to Sacramento and he sets up a new shop there and he lives there for a number of years. Uh, he contracted with the Union Pacific Railroad to build company stores along the Transcontinental Railroad in the 1860s. He went to Washington as a lobbyist for the 14th and 15th Amendment, uh, 
establishing equal rights and voting rights after the Civil War. He was apparently involved in another race riot there uh, where he was demonstrating with a number of uh, supporters of the amendment and they were attacked by a, a white mob who opposed the amendment. After that incident, he travels back to California and he has an uneventful few months until one of his business rivals in Sacramento has their store burned to the ground. And he is blamed for it and arrested for it and held in prison for at least two weeks. And he is put on trial until it's, the police do discover they arrested the wrong guy, they capture the actual arsonist, and he's let go with no recompense. Fortunately, this time he was able to hang on to his business. Um, he became one of the founders of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in California. He worked as a financial collector for them for a number of years. Uh, he was involved in local political activities. We know he was an advocate for Chinese immigrants during the attempts to restrict immigration in the 1870s and 80s. And at some point, no doubt due to his various legal problems, he went broke. And so in 1873, he wrote a memoir called The Life and Adventures of James Williams, which you can find easily on the internet um, since it's out of copyright. I will caution you, this isn't one of the more literary uh, memoirs you can find. It's not like <laughs> Frederick Douglass or somebody like that. About half the book is his story, half the book are his various musings on pressing, is pressing issues of the day like uh, the Modoc Indian War, or polygamy, or spiritualism. Uh, but nonetheless, this book was successful. It was republished over a number of decades. He would revise it every few years, I'm guessing, any time he needed more money. Um, for all my research, I could not find out when he died. He apparently did remain in California for the rest of his life. So quite an, quite an eventful life, and I spent at least part of it in Somerset, helping slaves escape. And this was a great story to uncover. Um, so, we have a little bit of time, maybe a few minutes, so I'll conclude here by say, emphasizing a couple things uh, that we touched on earlier. Um, the Underground Railroad, again, I think it, if there's no other lesson you take from these stories, it's that this is a story of Americans of different backgrounds and different races coming together to overcome a great moral evil, which is slavery. And we obviously live in a very divided and divisive time, but I think it's a lesson that we could all take to heart and hopefully find ways to apply uh, to our day-to-day -day lives and the way we work, we look at the world. Um, I think I have a couple minutes. Um, if there are any questions, i see if I can answer them for you. No? I guess this time. No, go ahead. Um, the best I have with you for now is kind of moral arts uh, thing, but it is rumor, and, and I'm not sure who started or who it was the rumor, but it's rumored that that was a, uh, on the, on the railroad thing. And is there any way to determine whether it's accurate or just a rumor? Well, let me put it this way. I could not find anything about it. I was directed to it by, it's either Mark Ware or Jacob Miller at the Historical Center, because they heard the stories. But in none of the accounts that I found references the Dressler Center or what was the Dressler Center being used as a, as a uh, way station. It could well have been, um, because another part of the reason, the problem with the records is that this was an illegal secretive activity. But that also makes it hard to verify, so to answer your question, probably not. It's possible, but I haven't found proof that that was the case. What about 1806? Where the building movement be 1806 antiques right now in Jenner's town. I have not heard that one. Because they were to have been involved in that, and that Simon that you talked about actually was so to have housed at a small building there. Oh, wow. And uh, the house is no longer there. But he can show you, the owner can show you where the foundation essentially is for it. Oh, well, thank you. And so it's very close to the, to the house that you talked about, which is off, you know, the 1806 has been around for yeah. a long time. Okay. And um, yeah. I can direct you. 
Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I know I hadn't heard that, that part of the story, but uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, anybody else? Um, I, I just want to make one comment. Yeah. I had gone to the Bible Museum in D.C., okay. and at that time they had an exhibit of the slave Bible. Oh, okay. And in it, they cut out, they wanted to teach people the Bible, but they cut out all the Exodus stories, you know, let my people go and all that. <laughs> it went down to about, you know, this much. But they had copies of it and everything. Very interesting. Right, and that's a, that ties to another point I didn't mention. Um, slaves were not allowed to learn how to read or write in most states in the South. Uh, Frederick Douglass in his uh, memoirs writes about this extensively, how he had a uh, white mistress who took a shine to him and actually did teach him to read, or write, read and write uh, covertly without her husband knowing, but he was definitely an exception um, because it was thought that if slaves could write or read, they would encounter inflammatory materials in Bible or literature or the slave or the slave correspondence, which like we said, they stopped allowing abolitionist mail to go south for a number of years. Um, so yeah, unfortunately that was another way that they worked to control slaves, what they knew, what they were able to do. I've often wondered about how the, the slave uh, was taught Christianity or the love of Jesus, because uh, I mean that that's kind of contrary to the the fact that there was a master and and the mistress. I mean, do you know anything more about that? And I'm I thought that was interesting what you said. It there's not a uniform answer. I guess how I would answer it is it depended on circumstance. Um, there was a lot of apologist argument for slavery that utilized the Bible and biblical teachings. Um, there was slavery in the Bible, therefore it was justified. Um, the story about uh, African Americans being descended from Ham and they were therefore cursed to be subordinate. Um, so a lot of times the masters would teach slaves a form of Christianity that emphasized their worldview, uh, that slavery was fine, that whites were superior to blacks and so on. Uh, the slaves, however, managed to adopt the language themselves, or adopt the religion themselves. They would read Bibles, they would read religious tracts, they would turn it into hymns to poems that they reflected very strongly on uh, their own experience. And since you mentioned uh, Exodus uh, a while back, uh, constantly in, in slave hymns and slave literature, there are comparisons to Moses, there are comparing themselves to the Jews or the Israelites of uh, ancient Egypt. Um, so they were very, despite the efforts of the masters to give them a very skewed uh, version of Christianity, they were, a, they were able to read the Bible and look at religious texts and interpret it in a way to their lives that actually, in most cases, ended up enhancing their desire for freedom rather than uh, flattening it. try um, I think it might be kind of hard to connect all the yeah. different sites mm -hmm. but uh, yeah that's a great idea take away at least like okay. yeah well thank you I'm learning stuff today too um, yeah and I'll mention um, depending on how interested you are uh, not only are a lot of the slave memoirs like James Williams and Frederick Douglass out of copyright and available online uh, Wilbur Siebert's uh, descendants have put together a lot of his source documents on the internet 
Um, and if you're interested, I'll look up the site for you here and see if I can get it to you. But you can find all manner of things, interviews that he did, oral histories that he did, uh, old newspaper articles. Like I said, he did a lot of research. Now again, you have to take some of it with a grain of salt because he wasn't super discriminating with what he accepted, but there's definitely a lot of interesting reading material if you're up for a deep dive into the subject. How long has he been diving into the subject? <laughs> this specifically about two and a half years. Um, like I said, this was something that we heard about at the historical center but didn't really know anything. Um, I remember talking with Mark about it, Mark Weir, who's the director of the Historical Center, and this would have been a while before it, but I mentioned, you know, well, we, we have this stuff on the Underground Railroad in the library, and he said, well, yeah, there's all these stories, but yeah, it's probably people making stuff up. And I don't, yeah, I don't blame Mark for thinking that, you know, I think that was the thought that I had too, and that a lot of people, because after the fact, you want to make yourself look like you're a hero who's helping the slaves escape. But uh, when we finally did some work, to dig into it, um, yeah, it, there ended up being a lot more material than we thought there was. All right, uh, anything else? Or? Oh. All right, well, thank you very much.